Obviously, if you know your geography, Israel and Egypt are just direct next door neighbors to each other. They're very <laughs> close by to each other. Um, and a significant portion of the biblical story, some of the most pivotal, mo pivotal moments, take place on the African continent. We should not take it for granted that Jesus himself was raised in Egypt on the African continent. Whatever you make of how brown were the people in the Bible, in the land of Israel, which is for sure the, the color grade that we're working with, the fact remains that the African continent is deeply tied to the story of the Bible. And I want to just add to what Brother Wendell said last week, early Christian history is deeply rooted in Africa. What do I mean? This is a book uh, by, this is Thomas Oden, who I'm quoting from. He is, of course, a white scholar, um, and his expertise is in what we call paleo-orthodoxy and early church studies. One of the things that he uncovered in the process of examining the early church fathers, people like Origen, Augustine, Irenaeus, Athanasius, Alexander, just this massive swath of people, maybe names you don't recognize. I'm sure most of you have heard of Augustine at very least. The staggering fact that some of the absolute most influential theologians in the entire, in the entire history of Christianity were native-born Africans. North Africa, yes, I know we just had the World Cup, I know this debate, does Morocco, does North Africa get to call itself real Africa? Do North Africa and the rest of Africa claim each other? I know that there's a debate about that, I know that there are issues there, obviously that's for people to sort out for themselves, but to cast all of North African history as non-black is anachronistic, it is just simply not factual. The fact of the matter is, there is a well-established, or at least was a well-established history of Christianity in Africa being highly influential on how Europeans did theology up through the first few centuries. Obviously, there is the painful and difficult history of colonization that did introduce Christianity to a lot of the African continent, and we do have to take that very seriously. However, we do a disservice to our church, to our members, to our own understanding of history if we don't take seriously the fact that Africa shaped the Christian mind and how we do theology. And I want that to be absolutely very clear. And one of the things that Odin makes a point in his book is that his research is preliminary and what is really, really necessary, in his opinion, is a new generation of scholars with African heritage, with knowledge of African languages and storytelling culture and just a, a cultural link to the land to go and do research, to go and do studies in these languages, in the storytelling of these people, in the literature of this time period in the early church so that we can have true insights into just how much African theology shaped early Christianity. And it's something that, I mean, how many of you have heard this before? A, a couple of you, and that is, I think, part of the travesty of how underrepresented this topic is. So I want to put that out there as a thought that black history must include the history of the United States of America, but it is so much more than that, and it needs to be explored in all of its richness. And I submit that to you um, as a paper-colored person today. Anyways, um, so... When Pastor Alex reached out to me to speak on the topic of worship and music, he saw uh, this photo of myself making my friendliest face, as you can tell. Um, myself and a fellow by the name of Marcos Torres, he is a Puerto Rican fellow currently based in Australia. We did a 14-part <laughs> extended podcast series called Deconstructing the Adventist Worship Wars. And the point here is not for me to just be controversial for controversy's sake, but to point out that there are a lot of misconceptions and a lot of very problematic ideas that have worked their way into Adventist history, into modes of Adventist thinking that have been and continue to be formative in our dialogue about worship and music. And I want to take the time I have here today, like I said, burning my time with preliminaries, to touch on some of these issues. Um, there will be some images and words, much similar to last week's sermon, that are a little unsettling, that are a little uncomfortable, and I did debate on whether or not to share some of them. I do think it's important for people who have not lived this experience firsthand to understand the full force of it, but I do not take anything lightly, and I, I hope you all understand that. Like This is for the purpose of being educational and accurate. Now, 
In our podcast series, one of the things that we touched on was the fact that a lot of the rhetoric, a lot of the talking points, a lot of the baseline assumptions that have been used in the Adventist and broader Western Christian conversations about music are definitively, explicitly anti-black racism, and it has just been this thoroughgoing thing that unfortunately a lot of people either choose not to remember or have not been presented with. And that is something that we go into detail in in the podcast. For those of you who are digitally inclined, that is a link to the podcast site. So if you feel like pulling up your phone camera and grabbing that link, that's there. If not, I can talk to you about it later. I talk too fast for myself sometimes, honestly. Um, we'll do, I'm doing my best. I'm doing my best. Okay. So if you didn't catch that, talk to me later. I can get that available for you. This passage that, I, that was read for you this morning in the book of Acts has struck me in powerful ways for a very long time, and I want to be as thorough as I can with this passage um, before moving on to kind of the historical section of this. Paul is on a missionary journey. He is going through Europe. He's traveling through Anatolia. Into, obviously, here he's in Greece, and the entire book of Acts is oriented around how the gospel gets from backwater towns in Judea to the heart, the capital of the Roman Empire, so that under Caesar's very nose, someone is consistently, day by day, proclaiming that there's another king, there's another emperor, there is another lord who is greater than Caesar. And Luke sketches out this story. How does that message get from Judea and Jerusalem to Rome? Paul, in this process, is confronting the reality of the world he lives in. Paul, a Jewish man, a man trained in the tradition of the Pharisees, the theology of the Pharisees, a man trained in Jewish interpretation of Scripture, a man also familiar with Greek culture and Greek philosophy and literature, a man born as a Roman citizen, this man who heralded from three different cultures in different ways, a man who existed between cultural spaces. He was navigating the dynamics of the Greco-Roman world at the time. And he comes in Acts 17 to the center, to the heartland of Greek philosophy. He comes to what may in fact have been at the time, well, one of the intellectual centers of the pagan world. Athens, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, you know the big names. There's plenty more, but Athens has its reputation for a reason. Paul comes into this town and he is struck by the presence of idols. He, as an observant Jewish person, the, the idolatry thing doesn't resonate with him. It really puts him off. He is not with it. But he keeps his eyes open. Paul keeps his eyes open to the culture he's walking into. He pays attention to signs of light and he catches one. He catches an altar where these Greeks, these Greek pagans have written, this altar is for a God we don't know about, to an unknown God. And Paul says, I see it. I see that you see it. You know that there's more. You know that you haven't exhausted everything there is to know about God. And on that basis, I am going to make a connection with you. Paul starts preaching. Paul starts speaking to these Greek philosophical individuals. In fact, they take him to the Areopagus, one of the key places where philosophical debates would take place. They begin questioning him. He tells the story of Jesus, but he doesn't quote the Hebrew scriptures at them. He doesn't proof text at them from the Torah or the Hebrew Bible. Instead, Paul does this remarkable, remarkable thing, and he says to them, you know, he tells them, God made up the whole world. God made all the nations of the earth. And then he goes, God did this so that people would seek him and maybe reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any of us. In fact, for in him we live and move and have our being. As your own poets have said, we are his offspring. What is remarkable in this passage is that Paul, in confronting these Athenian Greek philosophers, uses Greek poetry and philosophy to speak to them. He finds something in their culture that he can resonate with, and he demonstrates that he's already familiar 
with what they believe in. He demonstrates that he knows their stuff. These two quotations, and if I wanted to be really nitpicky and, and detail-oriented, the provenance of some of these is a little bit complicated, but the best scholarly reconstruction we have for the statement, for in him we live and move and have our being, is from Epimenides. That is the, the best scholarly guess at where he's coming from, that engar soi zomenkai kinothmeth Ede kai esmen. I'm so sorry about my Greek pronunciation, you guys, but I do my best. This is a poem. This is, in fact, a hymn to Zeus, the Greek god Zeus. Paul is familiar with it. Paul quotes it, and he takes this concept from their culture and says, well, I see a connection, and maybe this can help you understand where I'm coming from. The second quote is a little bit more certain in its provenance. This is by a philosopher named Eridus, which um, may in fact have been from the same place that Paul was from in Tarsus. Um, and he's the one who says, we are his offspring. But again, this is from another Greek hymn about Zeus. Raise your hand if you find that a little bit weird. Is, is weird, right? Like, why, what? If you think about the, the intensity of the rest of the Bible's disdain for idolatry and paganism, how, what is Paul doing here? What is going on? And this is, I think, the brilliance of Paul in this passage. Okay, so I, I'm, I'm, I've reached the end of this section as far as slides. This is the brilliance of Paul in this section. He... And you, I think you'll catch wind of this if you read other passages in Romans chapter 1 and 2. There's a couple other places where Paul seems to acknowledge, much like many other theologians since him have, that being a Christian doesn't mean you have to think everybody else in the world has been 100% wrong about everything ever. Real wisdom, real insight, real morality exists out there. There are people who are not of this flock, so to speak, to kind of quote Jesus, who know something, who have heard from God, who have some insight. There is really something there in every culture, including those that had not previously been introduced to Judaism or Christianity, to the Hebrew Bible, to the New Testament. There are people, and I think many of you can identify this in your own lives and the people you know, people who don't know the God you know, but somehow, sometimes, some days, you see him in them. You go places, and you recognize that little spark of the Holy Spirit that has been whispering to people, that has been speaking to people, that has been pushing folks in the right direction, however imperceptibly, maybe they don't really know that it's Him. But I think what it means to be a follower of Jesus and to be someone who truly loves God is to see Him everywhere, to find Him everywhere. One of the big misconceptions about mission that I think people have is that mission is us bringing God somewhere. Mission is us taking a God who is stuck in one place or kind of had a hard time breaking out of this circle and getting him over here. In the little amount of mission work that I've done, something that I've learned, something that was taught to me, something that I've come to value very, very importantly in my whole life is that mission is not me taking God places. Mission is me showing up somewhere that God already is and me plugging into what he's already doing there. And when Paul showed up in Athens, much as the idolatry caused him stress, much as he didn't really vibe with it, he said, let me see what God has already been doing with these philosophers. Let me see where they've already heard him and let me connect with them there not to come in condemning and yelling and saying, fix everything or I'm done with you, but he loves you more than I do. He found you before I did. Let me plug into what the Spirit is doing in this place. And I want this message to resonate very clearly. When we talk about multiculturalism in the church, when we talk about mission in the church, when we talk about all of these things that sometimes get reduced to buzzwords, we have to remember that there is no culture on earth anywhere that is 100% so far gone that God is absent. There is no culture in the world that we can glibly and dismissively write off as, oh, they're just pagans, oh, they're just heathens, oh, they, they don't know anything, they're uncivilized. 
that last little bit should remind you of some rhetoric that has existed in our world that has been used. And it is with those darker thoughts, those more harmful thoughts, that we must turn to the way that things have played out in our more recent, more modern history. So we're going to talk about the myths and legends of modern music, and I'm going to try to demonstrate the clear, um, you know, if you actually look at the evidence, if you actually look at the historical outflowing of things, the clear and unmistakable way that prejudice has shaped the way that modern North American people, and others as well, but modern North American people, think of and conceive of music and what that means for us and what we can do about it. You all with me so far? You know what's not with me so far? My throat, oh my goodness, I should have drank more water today. Anyways, health message for you, drink some water. This is a fellow named Robert Johnson. Anyone heard of Robert Johnson before? Show of hands? No? Okay, well. So, um, when I start telling his story, you might recognize some of it. Robert Johnson was a blues guitarist and singer. You can see the dates of his life. He unfortunately did not live a very, very long time. He, at one point, became known as one of the masters of blues guitar. He was a virtuoso. He was one of the best. Um, in fact, I'm trying to remember, I think it was one of the guys in the Beatles, the first time they listened to one of his recordings of him playing guitar, I think it was George Harrison from the Beatles, he thought it was two guys playing guitar because Robert Johnson was just that good. However, like many musicians, there was a time when he was not so good. Um, there's a musician by the name of Sun House who was alive around the same time as him and who was, in Johnson's younger days, much more accomplished than him. And Sun House would often tell him, hey, Robert, can you... Can you put the guitar down, man? That sounds real bad. Like, you're upsetting people. That's really bad. Please stop. Then, and here's where the mythology comes in. Here's where the legend telling comes in. Supposedly, one night, Robert Johnson went down to the crossroads near his house where these two roads intersected. And I'm telling you the way, as far as like when you consolidate all the legends together and, and how this has been narrated, he comes down to the crossroads and he, oh, thank you so much. Wow, so helpful. I appreciate that. Like, you have no idea how much I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, he goes to the crossroads and a man appears there. Make no mistake, the way this story is told, it is a black man who appears with him at the crossroads. This black man is, as far as the legend is concerned, Satan. Robert Johnson hands Satan his guitar. Satan tunes the guitar, plays a little bit on it, hands it back to Robert Johnson, and like that, he's a master guitarist. Like that, he's got the skill for music stardom. Just like that, he's got, oh, he's got, he's got the juice now. He sounds good. And he came back, and that guy, Sun House, who used to tell him, hey, kid, please knock it off, you're terrible. What happened? How did you get that good? What? You sold your soul to the devil. Have any of you heard a story like that before? Yeah, so. Bear with me. Ooh. Wow, much better. Here's the problem with that story. It didn't happen. The scholars who have studied Robert Johnson's life have reconstructed the timeline of his life. The amount of time between when Sun House was telling him, hey, kid, you're kind of bad, please stop playing, to, wow, you got real good. The actual time span between was two years. During that time, do you know where Robert Johnson was living? He was living with a fellow by the name of Ike Zimmerman, who was a guitar teacher. He was living with his guitar teacher for two years, practicing the guitar. Any guesses on how he got good at guitar? Wow. It's almost like that's how it works, but... Why did that story work? Why did that story catch on? Why was that story so compelling and so powerful? For one thing, there is this thing 
that derives from European culture called the Faustian legend. This story that has been applied to different people in different generations, saying like, oh, this person sold their soul to the devil, and that's what made them good at music. It is a line of thought that was applied to the classical violinist Niccolo Paganini, maybe you've heard of him. He's known as one of the great violin virtuosos of all time. He was so good at violin, it made people uncomfortable. They were like, ah, you shouldn't be able to play that. How are you doing that? Must be Satan. Because that's where, you know, beauty and art and creativity come from ultimately, right? Did I hear yeses? But that's the thing we do, is we assign things that belong to God to Satan when we get uncomfortable. Now, I'm not, I don't have time to go through this chart, but basically, let's talk about, now actually we'll talk about this for a second. Are there musicians today in our modern music styles who lean in really hard to the demonic thing? Yes, obviously. Why is that stereotype there in the first place? Why do some rappers go hard for the Satan thing? Why do some metal singers go hard for the Satan thing? Well, some of them probably have their own reasons, but those prejudices, those ideas were already there in rock music that led to metal, in the funk and soul and R&B that led to hip hop. Well, were there some people in those generations who kind of leaned into that? Sure, but that stereotype was already there in the jazz that preceded R&B and in the blues that preceded rock music. And were there some people in those generations who leaned into their disdain for Christianity? Sure there were, but why? Because the stereotype was already there. People were already calling the music that jazz and blues came from satanic. The work songs that the slaves would sing on their plantations. And why were those things called satanic and demonic and evil? Because they were a connection to people's African heritage. This entire line of thinking is roundly and thoroughly based in a prejudice against Africa and against black people and this idea that their culture and anything they produce must be of the devil. Unfortunately, these prejudices have continued down the timeline to us today, and I would like to evidence this with some quotations. Um, this gets ugly, and I'm not going to quote everything, I'm not going to say everything, but the truth is the truth. This is a fellow by the name of Henry Cowell. He was a kind of modern avant-garde composer. And one of the things that upset people about jazz music, especially the 1920s and 30s, was that uh, it provided an opportunity for race mixing, where white and black musicians would get together and make music and like have a good time and enjoy each other's company, which to many people was not something you were supposed to be able to do. Interestingly, many of the white musicians that were the most closely tied to black musicians, especially in major American city centers, were Jewish. Irving Berlin, George Gershwin, tons and tons of Jewish composers wrote for jazz artists. Even the song, if, you, if you're familiar with um, Strange Fruit, that was written about the experience of African Americans by a Jewish American who looked at the racism and said, this is intolerable, and he wrote this song. So there was a strong connection between Jewish people and black people in the United States making jazz music. And this guy, coming from more or less the classical tradition, did not like that at all. And he did not like the Jews at all. Then this fellow you might have heard of by the name of Henry Ford had some choice words to say. Uh, popular music is a Jewish monopoly. Jazz is a Jewish creation. This is not true. Jazz is a black creation. But Accuracy doesn't matter when you, you just want to hate people. Um, the mush, the slush, the sly suggestion of the abandoned sensuousness of sliding notes are of Jewish origin. And then he uses some words that I don't even want to repeat. I'm going to skip through some things. I don't want to skip the Caribbean, except to say that um, this is not just an American phenomenon. In the Caribbean, in Trinidad and Tobago, in Jamaica, these same kinds of attitudes on the part of white people, especially former slave owners, were running rampant. And many times, the conflict between allowing formerly enslaved people in the islands to sing their songs and do their dances was seen as a conflict between Europe, which represents Christianity, and Africa, which represents paganism. This is purely prejudice. 
This is not based on accuracy. Much like we heard today, no one is actually paper colored. Nobody's actually the color of my jacket. Race labels are not meant to be accurate, fair descriptions of people. They are meant to structure power to dominate, manipulate, and control people. That's why the language is extreme. Now, um, this is from a publication known as the Ladies' Home Journal. This was very popular from the 1920s all the way to, I think their last article was published in 2016, this journal. And it was essentially a, one of those magazines that had like cooking recipes, child raising um, advice for women, those kinds of things. And this woman, Anne Shaw Faulkner, wrote most of their pieces about music. And here's what she had to say. Jazz originally was the accompaniment of the voodoo dancer stimulating the half-crazed barbarian to the vilest deeds. Um, this was also used by other barbaric people to stimulate brutality and sensuality. It has a, oh, that it has a demoralizing effect upon the human brain has been demonstrated by many scientists. Back in the 1920s, this is 1921 that this was originally published, people were already saying, oh, well, the beat is bad for your brain. Oh, well, it's, it's, it's unhealthy for you, don't listen to it. It'll make you not know the difference between right and wrong if you listen to this music. She goes on and on and on. I can't go into it too much. Although, here's one for you. Syncopation, and she gets mad about syncopation, and then people ever since then have been getting mad about syncopation, the idea of offbeats and unexpected rhythms in music. By the way, boom, ka, boom, ka, one, two, three, four, that clap on the offbeat, that's called the backbeat. That's not syncopation. Anyone who tells you that that's syncopation doesn't understand music theory. Unfortunately, most of the people in Adventism who preach this stuff don't actually understand the music theory they're talking about, so please don't get led astray by that. But syncopation is found in its most intense forms among the folk of all the Slavic countries, especially in certain districts of Poland and Russia, and also among the Hungarian, and uh, she uses a slur there, it should be Roma people, not the G word. Um, this is the thing. And I want to point this out. When you allow prejudiced, hateful ideas to fester and become normative, when you allow them to be the status quo, it does, in fact, drag everyone down. It is, racism is bad for everyone, even those it confers benefits upon. Chew on that as long as you need to. I don't have the time to get into all the theory of this. By the way, I'm, I know I'm running a little long. I want to finish my points. I'm rushing. Uh, I'm going to do what I can. Um, so... These prejudices against Jewish people, against black people, against Slavic people, against the Roma people, do you see how like, all-encompassing the hatred here is? In fact, the rhetoric that was used by Henry Cowell and Henry Ford was actually picked up in Germany in the 1930s and became part of the Nazi party's music policies. They looked at what was going on in the United States of America with jazz. They looked at the way that jazz was starting to affect the kind of music that was being made in Germany, and they said, no, Bach, Beethoven, Mozart, good German composers, the height of human creativity. Our civilization, our culture is better than everyone else. Don't let that and what they used was degenerate music come in and ruin our society. Gotta love when literally the Nazis think it's someone else ruining society, right? Anyways, um, so all of these ideas, oh, here's one for you. Again, just, she makes this spurious, unsubstantiated claim that lots and lots and lots of scientists have proven, oh, that music with the beats and the drums and the blah, 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 it wrecks your brain so much that you can't tell the difference between right and wrong. This is, this is made up nonsense from someone who barely understands the music she's describing. And then we just continue to accept these ideas for the next hundred years. This is a fellow by the name of Christian Berdahl who's quite popular in Seventh-day Adventism. I have called this out before and I will continue to. Syncopation, by all occult experts around the world, agree syncopation is the source of occult power in pagan worship services. It short circuits the frontal moral lobe. He's speaking, of course, of the brain, this brain rhetoric. He's talking about how when you hear certain types of beats, certain types of drums, certain types of melodies, it takes away your ability to think about morality. It takes away your ability to make moral decisions. It takes away your ability to know right from wrong. Based on what, buddy? Based on what? The science is just quite simply not there to the same extent that, it's not there, that it wasn't there in the 1920s when this rhetoric started first being used. 
And then, probably what's the most upsetting to me, this is the 2015 updated edition of the Seventh-day Adventist Church Manual. May I read this to you? Music is one of the highest arts. Good music, good music, not only gives us pleasure, but elevates our minds and cultivates our finest qualities. On the contrary, debased music breaks down morality and draws us away from our relationship with God. Any melody partaking of the nature of jazz, rock, or related hybrid forms, or any language expression expressing foolish or trivial sentiments will be shunned. Explicitly, in the documents that run our denomination, it says, if you like jazz, if you like rock music, or if you like any related form of music or combination of those things that have derived from them, that is wrecking your brain. It, you should shun it. You should not participate in that. It's bad for you. It's foolish and trivial. It is the exact same rhetoric from a hundred years ago. It is the exact same misguided, hateful idea that says, I can just dismiss an entire culture, not even an entire culture, multiple cultures because black people are not a monolith. I can dismiss multiple cultures worth of people in one fell swoop because they're not like me and they don't conform to my Eurocentric way of doing faith, doing church, doing life. Now, I know we're moving right along. Um, I can't talk about this for too long, so I'm just gonna mention Dr. Lillian Dukan is an Adventist musicologist. She wrote a book called In Tune with God that is very thorough. If you are interested in looking into this topic more, she goes through the entire history. I mean, she's a classical musician by, by training, and she knows her stuff, and she goes through a lot of these misconceptions and mythologies and, and malformed ideas, and she kind of, it's basically a silver bullet to the debate. I don't know why more people haven't read it, but. It is very thorough, and I do recommend it. I don't even agree with everything she says, but it's thorough enough that it's, it's I think, uh, required reading for anyone who wants to deal with this topic in the Adventist church accurately. But syncopation exists in European classical music. The idea that that's what came from Africa is a myth. West African music in particular uses a lot of polyrhythms, which are a different thing than syncopation. But again, you have to be willing to respect a cultural form enough to understand it in detail before you can describe it properly. Anyways, I'm getting heated, and I'm also sweating because I'm literally heated. Pagan and other unhelpful labels, and then I will try to wrap this up. Uh, I want to do a little thought experiment for you guys. You guys want to do a thought experiment with me? Are you tired? No, okay, yeah, I'm tired, it's okay, you could admit to that. So, I want you all to imagine for a second, however unlikely this might be for you in your actual life, I want you to imagine for a second that you are in a heavy metal band, okay? And you're angry at Christianity, you don't like the church, and you want to make your heavy metal band sound as pagan as possible. Here's the thing, you already have <clears throat> crazy screaming, and you already have distorted guitars and really, really crazy drumming. You already have all of those things. What sounds are you going to add to this band to make it sound more pagan? Any ideas? Yeah, sounds or instruments or whatever. Weapons, that would do it. <laughs> yeah, that would, that would certainly make it intense. So here's the thing, this is not a hypothetical situation. In the mid-2000s, thank you for your suggestion, by the way, that's, that's cool. <laughs> um, in the mid-2000s, a bunch of bands, especially in Europe, people who were dissatisfied with Christianity, people who were upset with the church, people who were like, eh, I don't want to distance myself from that, I want to return to pre-Christian European culture, they decided for themselves, we're going to add some new instruments to our band. We're going to add some flutes and some bagpipes and some accordions and some harps and some fiddles. We're going to add that to our heavy metal band to make it sound more pagan. Flutes and violins and harps? What? But how? Why? I thought those were the good instruments. I thought those were the acceptable instruments. I thought those were nice. Europe had paganism too prior to Christianity. European culture has pagan influences in it just as much as any other place in the world. I'm half Japanese, right? I come from a nation that's so far flung 
geog geographically from the biblical story that I don't really get to pretend that I have any direct connection to it other than believing in the scriptures. But like, I come from a pagan culture, and I, I'm not ashamed of that. I'm not ashamed of who I am. I'm not ashamed of my culture. I don't think it's all inherently demonic. Are there things I don't practice? Sure. Are there limitations? Sure. Did Paul say, oh, let's all start worshiping Zeus now? No, in Acts chapter 14, when he's in, uh, I want to say Ephesus, the people there mistake him and Barnabas' healing powers as them being from the gods. And they're like, oh, look, it's Zeus and Hermes. They've come down to bless us with their godlike power. And the priest of Zeus comes out to Paul and tries to offer a sacrifice to him. And Paul says, no. People say, don't be so open-minded that your brain falls out. And sure, but I say, don't be, close, don't be so close-minded that your brain suffocates. There is a balance between these two things. Paul was able to see light and redemption and hope and the presence of God in Greek culture, even in spite of their paganism, but he didn't endorse it wholesale. He didn't just sweep everything in and be like, okay, now everything is you know, fair game. Sometimes people ask this question and they say, well, then is everything okay in the name of culture? Please explain to me which culture you think would make everything okay. Please tell me which culture you think has no moral limitations. Please tell me which culture you think just doesn't have laws or boundaries, and I think we can find out that the problem is the person asking the question, not the culture in question. Okay, a um, couple quotes, and then I will wrap this up because I know we're running a little long. Thank you for sticking with me. C.S. Lewis has this wonderful thought in Mere Christianity, and again, it's reflecting on the fact that the Christian does not have to believe that everyone else in the world has been 100% wrong about everything ever in the history of everything. And he says this, talking about how did God respond to the human plight, the, the problem of human sin. He says, what did God do? First of all, he left us with conscience, the sense of right and wrong, and all throughout history there have been people trying, some of them very hard, to obey it. None of them ever quite succeeded. But secondly, he sent the human race what I call good dreams. I mean those queer stories scattered all through the heathen religions about a God who dies and comes to life again and by his death has somehow given new life to men. And then thirdly, he finds the people of Israel and drives the message home to them explicitly. This idea that in other cultures there are people who have caught an echo of the true and living God, the one God, the God who is already everywhere whether or not you and I have showed up. If that's not good enough for you, Ellen White herself says, among the heathens are those who worship God ignorantly, those, who, those, sorry, those for whom the light is never brought by human instrumentality, yet they will not perish. Though ignorant of the written law of God, they have heard his voice speaking to them in nature, recall Romans 1, um, and have done things that the law required. Their works are evidence that the Holy Spirit has touched their hearts and they are recognized as the children of God. I should also mention, for those of you who are very in tune with Ellen White's writings, uh, my particular interpretation of Acts 17 might come across a little suspect to you because of some of the things she wrote retroactively about Acts 17 in her commentaries on 1 Corinthians. There's something to be said for that, but I will say if you read Acts of the Apostles, her book, not the Bible's Acts of the Apostles, or sketches from the life of Paul, she actually has very, very positive things to say about Paul's approach in Athens. Like, she thinks it was brilliant. So keep that in mind. She's a complex woman with a complex body of work that we have to take in context and carefully. So let me leave you with some thoughts. I know this has been uh, a lot of words very quickly and maybe a bit of a downer, but I want to leave this in a redemptive place for us, and let me share my final thoughts with you. What does it mean for this church family, for this congregation, for this group of people to live out the New Testament truth that God calls all people to himself? What does it mean for this congregation to worship as if all nations have been called to Jesus Christ? What does it mean for us to worship in a way that is not based on prejudice, in a way that is not based on hatred, in a way that, it, frankly, is not based on racism. I have some suggestions, and they're simple suggestions. I'm not telling you to go start a rock band. I'm not telling you to go become a rapper. I'm not telling you to go do something that you yourself are not comfortable with, or something that is not authentic and genuine to you. But look at the raw material you have in this room. Look at 
who is sitting in the pews and ask yourself, I say this as a member of the worship team, right? How many languages are sitting in these pews right now that never show up on that screen? How many people are there in this room who don't get to worship God week by week in their mother tongue, in the language of the heart? Or how many people are there who... I don't really like contemporary Christian music. I don't know if you guys know this. I don't like the, the CCM and the Hillsong and the Chris Tomlin. and It's just, it's not my thing. I do it because I know other people find it meaningful, and it's tolerable to me. It's not horrible to me. It's just like, eh, it's not my favorite. I, I can get into it because I know that the group values it. So what other areas could we be inclusive like that? Some of you may remember a little while ago now, but we had the South Asian Sabbath here a little while ago. You remember that? Uh, my wife remarked, my wife is a Jamaican-Canadian woman, and she said something that made me realize the, the thorough difference in our lived experiences. She said, you know, I love watching that happen. I loved listening to that. I loved watching the guy play that like hand pump organ and singing in his own language because I never knew that people could bring their own culture to church before. I've never seen it. And I'm sitting here thinking like, what? But then I'm thinking to myself, oh, of course, I grew up at the Toronto Japanese Seventh-day Adventist Church. I heard Japanese week by week singing in Japanese, preaching in Japanese and English. They do a bilingual service. So to me, it was a no-brainer. Obviously, you bring your own culture to church. But the way prejudice affects different people is not the same. Different people groups, it's not the same. We have to be conscious about making space for those who have been excluded, those who have been sidelined, those who have been marginalized. And it doesn't have to be a burden. It doesn't have to be a guilt trip. It can be something so beautiful. Can you imagine if everyone in this room, regardless of their heritage, regardless of their ethnicity, knew songs from the other cultures represented in this congregation? What if we were singing Ukrainian songs? What if we were singing songs in French and Spanish? I get the feeling that some Swahili or some Kinyarwanda would not be inappropriate in this church. But we have to work together to make that kind of thing happen. We have to work together to make that kind of thing happen. We could be a beacon in this community that says, hey, in this place, as we come closer to Christ, as we draw closer to God, inevitably we come closer to one another and we absorb each other's goodness. We experience the richness of each other's heritage. I think that is something that could very much happen. And again, speaking as someone who plays on the worship team, that means a little bit of extra work for us. That means maybe sitting down and working on some pronunciation that's unfamiliar. Maybe that means actually writing down a sheet with some chords and some lyrics and being like, man, we got to learn these songs. But it's not impossible. And I get the feeling that there are many people in here who would benefit greatly and be truly grateful to have a worship experience that speaks the language of your heart. So you can speak to God in the way that resonates most deeply with you so that the gospel of the kingdom could take root deeply in every single one of us and act as a foundation for our witness in this community. To God be the glory, great things he has done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son who yielded his life in atonement for sin and opened the life gate that all may go in.